to have Dan Beats here today to talk about Amendment 3 and to um, respond to a lot of the questions that have been raised primarily on social media. Um, Dan um, is a local attorney. I think most of us have known him and he's been a Mule Skinner member for as long as I have or longer. Um, he primarily represents people charged with marijuana law violations in federal, state, and municipal courts in every part of Missouri, and he's done this for 35 years. He is current, he's a former president of the Missouri Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Um, he was named Missouri Lawyer of the Year by Missouri Lawyers Media in 2019 for his work in helping to write and pass our current Missouri medical marijuana law. Um, he's also the coordinator for Normal, and I believe he's done that for a long time. Um, he's also the coordinator for the National Organization, well, that's the National Organization of Reform of Marijuana Laws. And he serves on Normal's national board. Um, he is chair of the advisory board of the Amendment 3 campaign. So he is, of course, the absolute best person to speak to us today. Thank you for being here, Dan. Thank you, Alice. Thanks to all of you for allowing me to speak to you today about Amendment 3. Um, Alice is correct on all those points. I, I have worked on this issue for, it's a sobering thought to me, uh, 50 years this fall. I attended Normal's first national conference in the fall of 72. Uh, which I got to attend because I was MSA president at MU at that time. And uh, the National Student Association was meeting in Washington, DC, and it coincided uh, with the first uh, National Normal Conference. So worked on this issue for quite a while. Uh, and it's evolved since then. Back in those days, only 12% of Americans favored legalization. We're now up to a very solid majority of Americans who favor legalization. Um, I will try to run through my PowerPoint quickly and leave time for questions. If I understand, we have until 1.15, so that should be doable. I wanna start out by pointing out that tomorrow is uh, an occasion on which you can learn even more, if you wish, about Amendment 3, uh, because the uh, fall of 22 Missouri Normal State Conference will take place online on Missouri Normal's Facebook page. All you have to do is type in Missouri Normal in your Facebook search and uh, the screen will come up and live presentations throughout the afternoon. Uh, I'll be speaking at noon and, and uh, probably showing some of the PowerPoints you're going to see today. Our chapter readers will speak at 1230. At 1 p.m., a uh, young woman from Kansas City who's worked on criminal justice reform for some time, Justice Gatson, uh, African-American who is very uh, much involved in the, in the Amendment 3 campaign, will be speaking. Uh, from 1.30 to 2.30, we have a panel of legislators, Peter Meredith, Tony Lovasco, Barbara Washington, uh, and perhaps others. Uh, at 2.30, Daniel Jones, who was formerly a Rolla City Council member and now under the, under the pseudonym of Waxy Brown, hosts a very popular cannabis-themed uh, radio program. At 3 p.m., John Payne, the Amendment 3 campaign manager, uh, will speak. And John's a very bright guy. He was our campaign manager in 2018 for medical marijuana and um, very knowledgeable. All of our speakers will respond to questions and comments as long as they're civil uh, during, this, uh, during this event. Um, you'll be able to enter those comments and questions into the Facebook uh, page. Um, at 3.30 p.m., Anthony Johnson, a Missouri native who lived here in Columbia for several years, uh, after graduating from MU Law School, went to Oregon and became a leader of the Oregon drug law reform movement. He was the leader of the successful 2014 Oregon marijuana legalization campaign. And then at 4 p.m., our keynote speaker, Rick Steves. Uh, most, if not all of you, I'm sure are familiar with Rick Steves. He hosts a program that runs on KBIA every Thursday evening and again on Sunday. Um, he hosts a weekly PBS uh, travel program. He's the world's most popular and successful travel writer. Um, and he uh, now serves as the chair of Normal's National Board. So I have the privilege of working closely with Rick and have come to know him rather well. And he's just as sincere and nice as he appears to be uh, on his programs. Um, but he is a uh, very uh, committed advocate uh, for marijuana legalization. 
uh, and uh, he's not at all shy about acknowledging his own cannabis consumption. Um, and then I may make some closing remarks at 5 p.m. So again, that's on Missouri Normal's Facebook page tomorrow afternoon. Now, Amendment 3 has been misrepresented in many of, especially the online uh, discussions that have gone on. I'm going to try to uh, respond to some of those, but also just give you a good overview of what Amendment 3 is really about. Um, but my little buttons aren't moving my, my PowerPoint forward. Why would that be? We aren't oh, seeing no. we aren't seeing your screen share either. I think you have to go we through are not. again. Oh, yeah, I think not. when Pam shared hers, she bumped you off. Well, I'm seeing my screen share. Is anyone else? Mm -hmm. I'm the only one, huh? Well, let's see here. You have to go back to your Zoom app and share your screen again. Um, perhaps. Let's see. I'm at my It's a green thing that says share screen. We well, you know I'm not I'm not seeing any uh, menu. You have to hover over it. I hover, think hover. I think you've got your um, PowerPoint at full screen. So maybe uh -huh. reduce that, then you'll see the Zoom stuff underneath. Okay, Escape normally does that, but it's not doing it for me now. Um, that's strange. How do how do you suggest I shrink the screen? I'm not an Apple guy. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> if my daughter uh, were here, she could tell us. I'll keep searching and I'll find something. Usually you can hit the yellow oh, dot at the top left-hand corner to um, minimize okay. whatever yeah. window you're in and then other stuff shows up. Behind. Is oh, good. Are, you, are you on a Mac, Carl and Marie? Yeah, maybe okay. that's Good. I don't know. There hey. we go. Yay. We, we, All right, then. We see it now. Thank you. I'll mute now. All right. There we go. I think I've got the correct buttons. So the fundamental thing that Amendment 3 will do is legalize for uh, people over the age of 21, the use, the possession, the purchasing, consuming, and importantly, the cultivating of cannabis. Many of the provisions of Amendment 3 are directly opposed to the financial interests of the industry. It is not. Uh, it is not a conspiracy by the industry to line their pockets. The fact is, most people in the cannabis industry are good people, just like most people in other industries are good people, and they're not selfishly trying uh, to just advance their own interests, despite the uh, despite the conspiratorial claims of some of our opponents. Um, cultivating cannabis. Uh, we have probably one of the most generous provisions in the nation among the 19 states that have already legalized in that every adult can cultivate up to 18 plants at a time um, continuously. There, there will be no shortage of, of cannabis available outside the industry, uh, outside of the, uh, uh, the uh, taxed and regulated system. Um, it will be legal, in fact, to give cannabis to other adults up to three ounces at a time. Um, there are many other provisions that don't favor the industry. Most important one being on slide two here, that there are no caps. And I don't care who says otherwise, they're lying. There are no caps. There are no maximum number of licenses which may be issued. DHSS, Department of Health and Senior Services, of course, the legislature or the governor can order more licenses at any time. That's why Governor Parsons' uh, comments about Amendment 2 are so hypocritical. All he has to do is pick up the telephone, call DHSS, and say, issue more licenses, and I dare say they'll do it. And if the legislature, who sets their budget, says, you guys need to issue more licenses, they will do it. Um, the House has already voted three times, and Peter Meredith is one of the leaders of this. Um, the House has voted three times to uh, order DHS to issue more licenses, when the Senate gets on board, there'll be more licenses. Uh, there are no caps. There are mandatory minimums, but there are no maximum numbers of licenses. And that does not benefit the, those who hold licenses in the industry. They have no guarantee. There won't be 10,000 uh, licenses to sell marijuana issued. Uh, and they're well aware of that. Um, I can't repeat, I think, enough that those who claim that this is some industry scam are wrong. 
uh, and I'm trying to restrain myself and be tactful about it. They, they are wrong. I'll leave it at that. Uh, since Colorado and Washington became the first states to legalize adult use of marijuana just 10 years ago, 17 other states uh, have joined them and teenage marijuana use has dropped dramatically since that time. Um, marijuana use by eighth and 10th graders dropped by 38% according to University of Michigan's annual survey. And that is the gold standard. Anyone who knows anything about this field knows the University of Michigan's annual survey um, is the most reliable in the nation. Uh, Colorado specifically had a 35% drop among teenagers who've used cannabis in the last month. Legalization does not result in more marijuana use by young people. It may, in fact, result in less. <clears throat> Amendment 3 would allow, again, every adult to grow up to 18 plants for personal use. And you know, that's at a time. That's why, you know, if you're uh, industrious and have a green thumb, you can have multiple uh, crops of 18 plants every year. You know, it does not help the industry when private individuals provide themselves and their friends uh, with cannabis uh, by growing it. Um, it will allow dispensaries to sell seeds and seedlings and clones. Now, we intended that originally with the medical bill. Uh, DHSS said, no, uh, it's, it's not really in there. So we're putting it in there. It'll be absolutely clear that anyone who wants to cultivate for themselves can acquire the seeds, seedlings, and clones to do so at their local dispensary. That does not help the medical industry. Amendment three will legalize giving uh, other adults up to three ounces at a time. Uh, one of the most important provisions of Amendment 3 is it will automatically expunge marijuana conviction, arrest, and conviction records for hundreds of thousands of Missourians. Every year, more than 20,000 people are arrested in Missouri for marijuana, most of the great majority of them for possession of small amounts. All misdemeanors will be automatically expunged. All felonies involving possession of up to three pounds will automatically be expunged. Now, other Larger offenses can be expunged under existing law. There's a waiting period of three years on a felony. Uh, that's not a bad uh, alternative. Uh, but frankly, some, you know, one of the criticisms we've gotten from the left is why, why my, my uncle who's in there for having 200 pounds isn't going to get an automatic expungement. No, he's not. Uh, and that's a shame. But we have proposed a bill we believe the voters of Missouri will accept. And it's not just based on our seats of the pants. We polled the voters of the state of Missouri to see what they would accept. And we crafted Amendment 3 to, com to conform to what the voters indicate they will accept. And, and they're just not ready to automatically expunge the 200 pound uh, marijuana cases. But that's one of the complaints that we hear over and over again. By the way, no state does that. No state does that. No other state has, through the initiative process, adopted automatic expungement. Automatic expungement is very important. I helped write our current expungement law in Missouri and helped pass it. It requires, of course, it came through the legislature. So it's horribly compromised in many ways. And one of the compromises uh, is that, um, is that uh, you have to uh, hire a lawyer, not technically, but in reality, you have to hire a lawyer. Not many lawyers know this law very well. You have to petition the court. You have to uh, serve uh, legal notice on a dozen government agencies. You have to wait for them to have a chance to object. You have to go back to court and appear in front of a judge and have a hearing. And that has resulted in a tiny fraction of the people eligible for expungement actually pursuing it. Automatic expungement will not require any action by the defendants. It will be far more effective, far more beneficial uh, to people who need jobs, who need homes, uh, who need uh, loans to buy a car or a home. It will increase state revenue. And Nicole Galloway's office estimates by 41 million, at least 41 million each year, in addition to the local tax option. There'll be a 6% sales tax. That will initially pay for the expungements and once that's been paid for, this money will be divided each year ad infinitum uh, 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 to pay for veteran services, to pay for drug addiction treatment, and to help fund the Missouri public defender system. The 3% local tax option, which every local city and town can impose if they wish, that 3% will be spent as they choose. It is estimated to provide another $13 million every single year. And those numbers are probably very conservative.
Amendment three mandates at least, at least is important, 144 new small business licenses be issued. This does not benefit the current license holders. It is intended to result in more diversity, more inclusiveness, more equity, uh, all the buzzwords we know uh, in this industry. Um, and, uh, you know, we went out of our way to create criteria that would benefit minorities. Um, you know, people with limited capital, limited incomes, limited property, people who live in high poverty communities, who are service disabled veterans, people who've been arrested or had an immediate family member arrested for marijuana, a couple of other categories, if you live in an unaccredited school district or you graduate from an unaccredited school, um, that's a sincere effort. However, some critics have said, oh, this is just scraps from the table. Well, it's not as if these are the only licenses. There's no limit on the number of regular, full um, dispensary, uh, manufacturing, uh, or cultivation licenses that can be issued. Now, our, our opponents uh, who claim to favor legalization, although I doubt it in some cases, but they claim that, that we should wait for the legislature to do this. My old friend, Chris Kelly, uh, first time we've disagreed on anything that I can recall. Uh, Chris says, oh no, we need to let the legislature do this. Well, you know, the legislature we're dealing with here is a bunch of right-wing nuts. You know, we've got the most ultra right-wing legislature that I'm aware of in the nation. They passed the most restrictive abortion law in the nation. They made it a crime to have books in school libraries. They're not going to legalize. I've been going down there for 50 years and trying to get them to do it. They're not going to legalize marijuana. People who say we should wait for the legislature to do it are either ill-informed uh, or they're not really sincere in their support for legalization. Uh, all the new licenses, by the way, including the regular licenses, as well as the, the small business licenses, will be issued through a lottery. The scoring system, um, at least with the company that the state hired to administer the scoring system uh, for the licenses uh, in the medical industry, was clearly a mess. It wasn't our fault. Um, but we're going to eliminate that by instituting a lottery system uh, for licenses in the future. If, if the government, if state government removes the limits, then the lottery will be irrelevant. But while there is any limitation on licenses, they'll be issued through a lottery. It, it will do several things to improve our medical marijuana law. Uh, among them is allowing patients to obtain a three-year medical card instead of a one-year card. Now, you may wonder why would patients even bother to maintain a medical card? And you're right, many of them will not. That's one of the reasons why we're giving a third of the 6% uh, sales tax income to veteran services. The current 4% tax on medical goes to veteran services. That will likely drop. So we're trying to make up for that by adding some additional revenue to veteran services. But there are a couple of reasons why some people may maintain their patient cards, um, and among them uh, is the fact that uh, the sales tax on medical is somewhat lower. More importantly, Amendment 3 establishes protection in job discrimination. That's one of the first things I heard from patients when we passed uh, Amendment 2 back in 2018, what's now Article 14, Section 1 of our Constitution. Um, they said, well, can my employer still drug test me and and still fire me. And unfortunately, under current law, they can. Under Amendment 3, they will not be able to do that. And that's a good reason to keep a medical card. The licensing fee for medical patients to grow for themselves is cut in half. Another illustration that this is not to benefit the industry. It, as I said, will provide employment discrimination protection for medical patients who use marijuana off the job, both in hiring and in maintaining employment. They cannot be refused a job or disciplined or fired because of legal medical use. It will also provide protection for everyone uh, in family courts. There are some courts, there are some judges, we use the euphemism court, there are some judges uh, who are so prejudiced that they would take children away from someone who is a, a consumer of cannabis, even though they do so responsibly and legally. Um, just as with alcohol, there are some people who consume alcohol responsibly. They don't deserve to lose their children because they have wine or beer with dinner. Um, and we don't think people who use cannabis responsibly should be discriminated against either. It'll prohibit the use of no-knock 
uh, and no knock and announce is really what they are, search warrants and marijuana investigations. We would, have, we would have prohibited all of them if we could. But if we get outside the topic of marijuana, we risk that Hammerschmidt challenge that we successfully fought off uh, just a few weeks ago. It ha everything in the bill has to deal with marijuana only. But it will prohibit no-knock search warrants for marijuana, and a large number of the search warrants issued in the state are for marijuana. It will not allow the odor alone to be probable cause for a search, and that's important. Now, again, that seems logical. You would think that right now, because uh, medical is legal, that the smell of marijuana wouldn't necessarily be probable cause. But I can tell you, even for patients who are stopped on the highway and an officer says, I smell cannabis, and they show them their card, there are still searches taking place. We're going to make it explicit that that is not probable cause for a search. It will prohibit pre-trial release. People who are charged with an offense and are out on bond currently in many counties are subjected to random drug testing and thrown in jail. If they test positive for marijuana, we're going to stop that. Uh, we're going to prohibit people from having their probation revoked only because of legal marijuana use. Likewise, parole will no longer be revoked merely because someone uses marijuana legally and responsibly. Um, anybody currently on probation only for marijuana offenses that would now be legal will be eligible for immediate release from probation, likewise for parole. Many people serving prisoner jail time now will be able to petition for immediate release. And the wording, we've gotten some pushback on the wording. Hey, Don. Hey. Uh, the wording says the judge, the court shall grant that petition absent good cause to the contrary. Well, you know, if need be, the appellate courts will decide what good cause is. But I think an example that, that I've heard is if you're charged with murder and marijuana, and the prosecutor drops the murder charge and you plead only to marijuana, maybe that would be good cause if there's really evidence for the murder charge. You know, I mean, there are circumstances where it might make sense to deny that petition, but the vast majority will be granted. It will require a vote of the people, not the council uh, of a local community to opt out of, of adult use marijuana sales. So that option exists, but it's not gonna be done just by the council, it requires a vote of the people of that community to reject that uh, that option. It will prohibit several states of past laws that say if you test positive for marijuana, then you're automatically guilty of driving while intoxicated. Well, you test positive for a month or more after your last use. Those laws make no sense. We, we will prohibit such a law from being passed here. Uh, luckily, no such law exists in Missouri and we don't want one to. <laughs> in fact, some states have repealed those laws recently. It will double the number of patients for whom a caregiver can work. Now, under current medical marijuana law in Missouri, caregivers uh, are authorized to assist patients in obtaining cannabis. They can't consume it legally, but they can grow it or they can purchase it for a patient. Uh, currently, they can only grow for three patients. Uh, under the new law, it'll be uh, up to a half dozen patients. Some people can actually make a living or supplement their income uh, by serving a half dozen medical patients who are allowed to pay the caregiver for uh, their time uh, and the expenses involved in cultivating uh, cannabis. Once again, this is counter to the interests of the industry. It was the uh, most important thing it will do is stop the great majority of the 20,000 marijuana arrests that happen each year in Missouri. And that will have tremendous savings, although no one can calculate precisely how much. Uh, right now, 20,000 cases are on the dockets of our courts. 20,000 times a year, police take their time and our money to arrest people who don't need to be arrested. Uh, prosecutors spend time prosecuting these cases. Judges uh, uh, spend time adjudicating them. Uh, probation and parole officers spend time supervising these cases. Uh, it's a tremendous waste of public tax money. With 20,000 cases off the dockets of our courts, then our courts and our cops will be able to spend their time and our money dealing with serious crime and leaving marijuana consumers alone. Uh, and that's exactly uh, the point here on on slide 30. And for more information, as I've mentioned in the chat, uh, LegalMo22.com is our campaign website. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. And we have some questions in chat. Uh, let's back up uh, seeing 
one from David Robinson, will the persons whose records have been expunged be notified formally, or will they learn about it only if they take the trouble to visit a website or something like that? Well, that's a good point. And we certainly expect that state government will notify people if they can find them. Um, you know, these records go back many years. Some of these people are from out of state. The vast majority are Missourians. Uh, I think I can say with confidence the courts will make an effort to reach the people uh, who have been expunged. All right, thank you. Another question in the chat. Uh, Caleb Paul asked, why didn't you define good cause in the referendum? Is it well, because there are just too many circumstances that might constitute good cause. Um, I can tell you the original drafting simply said that people may petition the court to get out of jail. Uh, and I said, wait a minute, if we just say petition and we don't say it shall be granted, we're going to have judges who, who just routinely deny them. So the language about uh, and shall be granted uh, is my language. And then uh, Brad Ketcher, our attorney in St. Louis, said, well, maybe we better allow for some extraordinary circumstance. Um, so, I mean, uh, you know, the purpose of that wording, and it's not unique to this law, is to give judges some discretion. Uh, but there is always the right to appeal. If judges apply that, uh, uh, that discretion uh, in uh, an inappropriate manner, in an arbitrary manner, I think I can predict with confidence the courts of appeals will straighten them out. Okay. And Dave Taylor has raised his hand. Dave. Dan, is it okay if I turn off your screen share so we can see you when you're talking? Yeah. Okay, sure. thanks. I didn't know you couldn't see me. I did. Well, I've got you on split view, so I was watching you along with the other one. But Okay. Uh, a lot of the yeah, stuff I see you guys. Learn. Uh, Carl and Mari Scala asked, do, does the expungement apply to people convicted just of possessing marijuana paraphernalia? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, I just verified that last week for someone. Alice Taylor, Alice Taylor asked if you can would share your side, shots, slides with Pam Springsteel or with, with Alice in a way after your talk, that way Neil Skinner, they can include it in their announcements that we're sending out so people can review them themselves. Uh -huh. so I'd like to answer Wim Caldwell's question because we've heard that from a lot of our critics. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind, yes, sure. more than six ounces will remain a misdemeanor offense. There is no state. You know, we don't have any motive to give people criminal convictions. You know, these idiots who are, and I use that word <laughs> specifically, uh, who are trying to make people believe that that's some kind of nefarious conspiracy plot are, are full, of, uh, full of it. Um, every state has a limit on the amount of marijuana that consumers can possess. I don't know why anyone would need to have more than six ounces unless you're selling pot illegally. You know, it, it's not going to legalize everything. And if we tried to legalize everything, it would not pass. So yes, having more than six ounces on you will still be a misdemeanor offense. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and there's no state that says you can possess pounds of marijuana. Uh, that's just a, a false argument. That's a red herring. Um, you know, we, we tried to write a law that would not only be good, uh, but would pass that the voters would accept if we you know if we had said you can have six pounds of marijuana on you at all times we would be getting grief about that i guarantee you okay. caleb hall has his hand raised caleb go ahead hi thanks david uh thanks for coming and speaking dan um you're welcome i'm, I'm going to try to phrase this more as a question and not a comment like some people can try to do but i'm not going to lie i take a little bit of issue when you start your talk by calling everyone that has misgivings about this a liar you no i'm not calling everyone who's just kidding i'm calling the people who who are sowing those misgivings liars they're making well, false statements. So dan you said that this law does not in any way promote or is somehow give an advantage to people that already have established medical marijuana licenses. I didn't say, that, I didn't say that. That's called the straw man argument. I did not say that. So it gives like a phrase current that? license. Let me let me answer. It it gives an advantage to current license holders, if that's your concern. Yes, it does. So does virtually every other of the 19 state laws that have passed. If you've got a group of people who have already gone to the trouble and expense of complying with all of the state regulations and requirements, if you want cannabis to be sold to non-medical adults sooner, 
then it is only logical that those people who are already up and running should have the first opportunity to expand uh, into non uh, medical sales. But there is no limit, Caleb, on the number of licenses that can be issued to do that. I just wrote to Lindahl Fraker. <laughs> Is a Missourian on here? Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, I just wrote to Lyndall Fraker, the head of the state medical program yesterday. I said, Lyndall, since we're going to have at least four times as many potential customers for marijuana once Amendment 3 passes, wouldn't it make sense to expand the number of business licenses? He hasn't replied yet. But again, Caleb, the governor, who, you know, the governor complains that we don't have enough licenses. Well, he can order more. Uh, the legislature can order more licenses. Our opponents claim that we should wait for the legislature to legalize. Well, it should well, be no problem. No let's problem. Let's get my question legislate. on that then. You say that there's no limit, and I will grant you that the resolution says that there's a set minimum and that the department may raise it, but there's also language in here that says that no elected official may interfere directly or indirectly with the department's activities under what you're authorizing. So how can any elected official, legislature, governor, or anyone request that the department change the limits when you did not define interfere? The governor is not listed there. The governor uh, calls the shots at DHSS. There's nothing in that language that prohibits the legislature from mandating. An individual legislator, yes, should not be meddling in the process. We're trying to avoid um, undue influence. We're trying to avoid legislators trying to bully DHSS into giving their buddies licenses. And I think that's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, it does not prohibit the legislature from mandating additional licenses. It does not prohibit DHSS from issuing as many licenses as, as they choose to do. But it also doesn't authorize the legislature to expressly raise the limit, does it? No, it doesn't do a lot of other things. It means what it says. It doesn't mean things it doesn't say. You're right. And why should Missourians accept any limit on the number of businesses? We don't limit the number of liquor stores in the state. Well, I don't think we should. We should lobby the governor, the legislature, and the DHSS to increase the number of licenses. But when we want the voters of Missouri, most of whom do not consume cannabis, to pass a law, and when they say, we don't want to see a pot store on every street corner. We don't want to be like Denver, uh, where there are hundreds of dispensaries throughout the city. We say, well, the government has the discretion to put some limits on the number of licenses. It is a compromise, which we think is reasonable, which is what has been done in most other legal states, and one which will help to pass the amendment. And you don't think your language that no elected official may interfere with the department is somehow going to interfere with that lobbying? No, I don't think they're. I don't think our courts are going to say that means the legislature can't uh, order DHSS to issue more licenses. I think it'll be interpreted as we intended it that individual legislators cannot try to uh, strong arm DHSS into giving licenses to their pals. Well, thank you for answering my questions. I don't wish sure. to filibuster the floor. Um, as someone who's been involved in drafting, though, I. I'm concerned about people relying solely on intent instead of what it says. I think it says what it means. All right, there's a question that's in the chat. Has legalization ever come out of a legislative committee? Uh, it did this year, but only after it was amended to include caps on the number of licenses and only after it was amended in other ways, it never made it to the floor. And that's the furthest any legalization bill has ever gotten. All right, thank you. I think we've covered all the questions in chat. Um, uh, Carl and Mari, hands up raised, go ahead. Yeah, I just have a question. Um, trying to think things through about, I, I don't doubt the statistics that you gave about, um, the fact that doesn't in states that have already done this, uh, more youth are not taking up smoking marijuana or imbibing marijuana. Yes, but um, can do you have any ideas about why that is? It seems kind of counterintuitive that if it's more broadly available and legal, that there might be an increase. So. Sure, sure. Uh, one of the reasons that that is often. Uh, discussed is that 
illegal drug dealers do not card consumers. Illegal drug dealers generally don't care how old their customers are. They have no reason, no incentive to care how old their customers are. But those people who hold marijuana licenses to deal legally, they're very concerned about keeping those licenses. And there have been, there have been just as there are with alcohol vendors, there have been efforts um, in Colorado in particular to send young people into those stores who look older than they are and see if they're able to buy cannabis. And very, very few cases has anyone taken that uh, risk. Um, you know, another great advantage to legalization if people are worried about the welfare of the consumers is that testing is required in the legal cannabis market, testing for both purity and potency. You don't get that with black market dealers, with illegal uh, dealers. They're, you don't know with certainty uh, whether there's mold. Uh, it's, it's, it's a myth that people put free drugs in, in marijuana. That almost never actually happens. Uh, but indeed, there, is, uh, uh, there have been problems with mold uh, in illegal marijuana and perhaps other contaminants. And you never know how potent what you're purchasing is uh, in the illegal market. But you do know. Uh, you do know in the legal market. Um, another, so, as a follow-up, as a follow-up, Dan, um, is there is there evidence then? What what you're saying implies that the presence of legal marijuana tends to shut out or drive out the illegal sales. Yes, eventually that'll be true, just as with alcohol prohibition. It didn't happen overnight, but eventually most of those stills up in the hills. Uh, went out of business, you know, and the illegal alcohol dealers went out of business. And our hope and intent is the illegal cannabis dealers will become a thing of the past as well. And let me say too, as to your first question, uh, Marie, that uh, another, uh, another reason why young people use drops is the old forbidden fruit uh, theory that, uh, that there's a certain fascination and attraction to things that are forbidden. Um, and uh, that uh, when it's something that, that adults do, it's not necessarily as attractive to young people. Now, you know, everybody's different. Every kid is different in his or her motives. Uh, but that may be a factor in the dramatic reduction in youth marijuana use in recent years. Cool factor. Pam, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. I do. Dan, I want to read to you what the League of Women Voters of Missouri wrote right. in their paper about the issues. The opponents of Amendment 3 say that minorities and low-income Missourians would not be able to get into the industry. There's, there's just no truth to that. Uh, uh, they have at least the same opportunity to get into the industry that everyone else has. No one knows how many, how many of African Americans applied for medical marijuana licenses. So no one can say with any degree of certainty how many of those applicants were denied. There's not a race box that you check off on the application. Um, there are African Americans who are in the industry already. There are other people of color, including uh, uh, East Indians right here in Columbia who are in the industry. Um, there, there's nothing about the medical marijuana industry that's fundamentally different from uh, the shoe industry uh, or the food industry. Uh, it is true that people who have capital tend to do better in a capitalist system. Um, so, uh, you know, some how much people, is a license? How much is a license? An application is fifteen hundred, and it's refundable for these small business licenses. Okay. Um, it also says minorities and low-income Missourians would face difficulties getting legal resources to expunge records. That's that's totally meaningless. It's <laughs> it automatic. won't cost a penny. It won't cost a penny to expunge records under Amendment Three. Okay, thank you. Sure. I sure. wish they would have let me help write it. <laughs> and you? <laughs> well, I'm sure Ethan Thampy would love to write it. Uh, but, uh, um, uh, uh, Steve, I have a question from Steve Magnino. Uh, you're muted, Steve. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. You I was just saying, Dan, thank you. I, I, this has been really informative for me. I think that I have a much better understanding of the issue and 
And it's certainly much broader in terms of the implications. And I was thinking mm -hmm. as you're going through it about the number of issues that hadn't even occurred to me uh, with it. So, so thank you for being with us. Sure. Um, I guess the question I have for you is, how confident are you that um, Amendment 3 will will pass? Do you think it's going to be closed? Do you think yeah. after 50 years, the time has finally come? Um, I'm just kind of curious as to if you had to handicap it for us today, what's your best guess realizing that anything can happen in a referendum? Yeah, my best guess, Steve, is, is that it will pass, but, but I don't have absolute confidence in that. There are so many... Uh, there are so many people who are the, either either telling lies or the victims of those who are telling lies uh, mm -hmm. that it's hard to predict. I mean, we have support from the Kansas City Star and the mayor of Kansas City, but we don't have support from the St. Louis Post or the mayor of St. Louis. You know, uh, uh, both those mayors are African-Americans. Uh, there's no unanimous African-American position on this issue. While the state NAACP has taken a position against it, Four of the state chapters, St. Louis, St. Louis County, St. Charles, and Columbia, are all in favor of it. So there's, there's a great deal of, uh, I mean, reasonable people may differ about this, but I, I hate to see reasonable people be the victims of, of illogical or untrue right. arguments. The St. Louis Post, for instance, argues that <laughs> they, they argue from both sides of their mouth and their editorial. They acknowledge the fact that the legislature is never going to legalize marijuana but they think that it's just not right to put it in the Constitution. Well, four years ago, they had no trouble putting medical marijuana in the Constitution. So now they say, well, the, the problem is that once it's in the Constitution, the inevitable flaws which need to be corrected, uh, it'll, it'll just be too difficult. Well, it's not that difficult. Our legislature can propose any change it wishes to Amendment 3 or to our medical marijuana law for that matter, or to the bingo law for that matter, they can propose any change they wish, any time. And, and it's on the next election ballot. That's why when Barbara Hoppe talks to us next Friday about the other three constitutional amendments that are on the ballot on November 8, all three of those are put there by the legislature. If the legislature thinks amendment three has some fundamental flaw, then they should propose a further amendment. Making it constitutional protects it from arbitrary and capricious legislative actions. And they would re they would just repeal it if it were a statutory initiative. Um, they can't repeal it. They can propose repeal, but the people wouldn't vote for that. If there is some problem with Amendment Three, if it's so clear that everyone can see it, then surely the legislature will place further amendments on the next issue, on the next a uh, ballot rather, just like they put three of them on this November eighth ballot. It doesn't take months. I'm sorry. Not difficult. You don't have to gather signatures. Don't forget Thank the you. League of Women well, Voters of Columbia, Boone County, did a, a study and we endorsed it. Indeed, we did. And, and I enjoyed being part of that. And I see Margaret Tyler's with us. And Margaret worked on a study uh, uh, with the League uh, probably 20 or 30 years ago, I guess, that reached a similar conclusion. Uh, so, yes, I appreciate uh, having a chance to work with the League. Uh, and in fact, at one point, the Columbia League had endorsed Amendment 3, but then we learned that the state league doesn't think we should take a position on a state issue. Alice, Alice Turner has her hand raised. Go ahead, Alice. Okay, so I, um, two um, items. One, I just wanted to reiterate that the Boone County um, Central Committee has endorsed Amendment 3. Um, even though there's some other areas in the state they may have not, we have definitely endorsed it. Um, Secondly, I just wanted to raise something that you talked about at the League of Women Voters. All these naysayers that say this is not a perfect law, it's not modeled on any other state law, whatever. The ballot issue, as Kip talked about when he spoke to us, is likely going to be changed next year so that it is very difficult to pass any progressive ballot issue until we retake the legislature in the year 2050, uh, 2032 maybe. Um, so I just wanted to have you comment on that, please. Well, you're absolutely right. And thank you for reminding me of that. Um, that's absolutely true. People who, who think the Missouri General Assembly is gonna legalize marijuana are just indulging in a fantasy. But some people think that somehow another better marijuana legalization initiative might get put on the ballot. 
We don't know who's going to come up with the several million dollars that it would take to do that. But even if that were to happen, you're absolutely right, Alice. The Missouri General Assembly is determined to deprive us of an effective initiative uh, process. It's already extremely difficult. That's why we were the only ones that made the ballot this year, because we were the only group that had enough money, thanks to the medical industry, uh, to gather the signatures. It's really difficult right now. You have to run six concurrent campaigns in six congressional districts in Missouri. You have to meet a minimum number in each one of those six districts. And it's not easy, but it could become virtually impossible if the if the Republican majority in Jefferson City has its way, it will become effectively impossible. There were 20 bills filed this year to make the initiative process more difficult. And it's likely that they're gonna pass eventually uh, a bill that, that effectively ends the initiative process in Missouri. Dan, we got three. Laurie, um, I just wanna interject. There are a couple more yes. questions in the chat, David. Yeah, you... that's what I was gonna say. There are three right. that showed up in, in chat. Uh, one from Caleb, one from Kathy, and one from Winnie. Uh, you just want to look at those, Dan? And like I said, the first one from Caleb sounds. Yeah, and I, I think he's, he's right as far as the, the the full regular licenses. I don't believe that's true as to the small business licenses, the so-called micro licenses. Those those are going to be available far sooner uh, than uh, than uh, 548 days, if if I recall correctly. Um, 548 days is, what is that, a year and a half? You know, it's not a terribly long time. Um, it will give the people who are current license holders an advantage. I, I do not deny that. They are the people who came up with $6 million so far to put this on the ballot. I don't think that's a terrible trade-off. We're not going to get legalization any other way. There's just no realistic path to legalization um, any other way. But I pointed out throughout this presentation, I hope, uh, the many, many ways in which the industry is disadvantaged uh, by Amendment 3. As far as new requirements for law enforcement, no, I, at least I can't think of any new requirement uh, other than the ones I've referred to. In other words, yeah, they can't search people just because they think they smell marijuana. So that might be a new requirement. Um, maybe, Kathy, if you could be more specific, I'm, Maybe I'm just not thinking of what you're referring to. Dan, it says in my thing that there, uh, there's a $100 fine for yeah. smoking marijuana in public. Right, right. That's right. And, and we get a lot of complaints about that. You know, uh, there's only one state that allows public marijuana use. The voters of Missouri are not ready to embrace that. Um, people walking down the sidewalks downtown smoking joints uh, is not what most voters want to see. You know, you can't even walk on down the sidewalk drinking, you know, and, and, and that's probably the best analogy. There are laws against consuming alcohol in public. And yes, there will be a law against consuming cannabis in public. Lots of people don't want themselves or their kids exposed to marijuana smoke. Um, but it's far less right now. If you're possessing, let alone using marijuana in public, you're eligible for a year in jail and a $2,000 fine under state law. Under Amendment 3, you'd be eligible for, at worst, a $100 fine. No arrest, no criminal record, no jail, maximum $100 fine. You know, again, I think that's a pretty reasonable trade-off. Um, the voters won't pass smoking joints on the downtown sidewalks. <laughs> you know? Sorry, I wish they would, but they won't. <laughs> And then Winnie uh, um, has a statement. Uh, the normal fact sheet states that anyone serving prison time for marijuana can petition the court for immediate release. What cost does that person incur? Well, there would be some cost. There, there, you know, I mean, I think realistically, those people would be wise to hire an attorney. If I recall correctly, Amendment 3 requires the public defender's office to publish a, a petition form uh, so that, you know, one could petition the court without an attorney. But, you know probably be a good idea to hire a lawyer. The filing fee for, it would, uh, I think that would be considered a civil suit, varies somewhat from county to county. Um, and if you're indigent, you can apply to the court to waive the filing fee. Um, most prisoners probably would qualify as indigent. 
So the cost is not dramatic, but it, you know, it, there would be some costs involved. Well, personally, Dan, uh, me not, not being uh, a lawyer and uh, thankfully not being involved in court system much, can you explain the difference? If they're already serving time, they'll automatically be in sponge, but if they're no. currently, what, what no. is the- what If is they're the serving law? time, if they're serving time, they won't be immediately expunged. Uh, once they're released, then then they can then they'll be expunged. People who are serving time for offenses of large amounts uh, would be required to petition for release. Um, there, I don't know whose opinion it was, but we got an opinion from someone who seemed to know what they were talking about, that the Department of Corrections just wouldn't respond unless they got a court order. So uh, that's why that's why the process is set up that way to require someone to go to court. But I tell you, I got a list of clients who I'm going to be filing these for in December. Um, and it's not going to be terribly expensive for them. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, I, I can't wait. <laughs> I really look forward to going back to court and saying, Your Honor, I love to wave the Constitution around in court. You know, I have a printed copy. Your Honor, the Constitution of Missouri, the voters of our state have mandated that you let this guy out of prison. Um, and here's the proposed order. Will you sign it? You know, and if they don't, we'll go to the Court of Appeals right away. I think most judges will follow the law. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and slip out. I've got... I'm, scheduled to work at the Democratic office, but oh, as I don't know as how late it is. I don't want to keep people. Uh, I've actually got some other commitments this afternoon myself, uh, but I do encourage you to tune in for at least part of the conference tomorrow on Missouri Normal's Facebook page. Just just go to Facebook, search Missouri Normal, and you might scroll down a little bit, but you'll see uh, live presentations about this topic from a lot of very knowledgeable people, including Rick Steves. What time again? Uh, from noon to five, Rick speaks, okay. at four. Rick speaks at four, our campaign manager speaks at 3.30, no, three o'clock. Anthony Johnson speaks at 3.30, um, legislative panel at 1.30. All right. Well, thank you, Dan, for being here hey. with us. Appreciate it. Everyone come back next. Let's, let's thank Dan you all very much. Thank okay, you, thank you. Send me your slides, Dan. Okay, I'll do that. Have a good week. Everyone turn back in for us next week. We